everyone. My name is Sumner Frizzell. I'm the Events and Program Specialist with BC Food and Beverage. Very happy to be here with all of you today and super excited to welcome back Phil and Kenny from This Commerce Life for today's webinar. And they're also being joined by Jessica Malek. She is a consultant and will be sharing some very valuable information. So I will let the three of you take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Sumner. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Happy New Year. Um, I hope uh, I hope you all had a nice break and a chance to be able to just unplug a little bit. I know I was really, really thankful to get the chance to just breathe and calm down a little. Um, the end of the year was a little crazy. So um, what we thought we'd do today is, is kind of like continue some of the momentum we had from the back half of last year. Back half last year, we started talking about planning, annual planning, what that looks like. We're into the new year, and and so it's kind of like, how do you make the most of the year, your plans? Um, so we're gonna we're gonna continue down that discussion. We um, we asked Jessica to come with us. Jessica, you may or may not know from Social Nature, from her days at Social Nature, she is um, an, a consultant extraordinaire. And then what we one of the reasons that Jess. Um, is on this as well is is because um, you know Kenny and I try and stay as authentic as possible, and we're about to talk about how you track plans and hold yourself accountable to plans. So you've been on enough webinars that Kenny and I are okay at this, and we do a lot more of like do what we say and not what we do. Um, and we had to bring someone who actually does what she says she does. So um, it's just us being authentic. We're trying to make sure that you get the best possible advice you can. Um, you know, so, so you're going to see a little more organization as well. And that's, that's the Jess touch. So, um, so anyway, um, that's why Jess is here, but she's amazing. And I think you guys will learn, uh, a lot from her as well. So let me share my screen, um, and we'll get into this. Um, and then, you know, uh, you can, you know, I think traditionally we've, we've done questions like throughout and then also throw things in chat. Your annual plan actionable and hit your goals in 2024. So pretty important. We talked about um, making sure that um, you know, you you are in fact kind of like hitting your plans and making sure that you were making proper strategic plans last year. Um, is it freezing or is it just me? For Jess and where to find. Oh, I was just gonna oh. say, I think it is freezing. Sorry, Phil. Could your Wi-Fi keeps freezing? If you can hear that. I thought it was mine too, so I'm glad it wasn't me. Mm. Is that me? Did I, I think cut so. out? Yeah. Yeah, seems so. Um, Jess, you have the presentation, yeah. right? I do, yeah. Do, do you mind? I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. I'll be proactive yeah. here. I'm worried about sure. I'm worried yeah. about disappearing on you guys because I don't know why it's doing that. Um yeah. Jess, Jess will um just share her screen. Maybe that'll sure. help a little bit. Yeah, no worries. Let me just uh get it in the the presentation mode here um so so while jess is loading that um i think um we'll, we'll make sure that we we get um jess's contacts to you as, as well they're at the end of the presentation um and then we're gonna do kind of like three things today um so when jess pulls up the the deck what you'll see is we're, we're gonna we're gonna set out a framework for you to be able to um you know, kind of like goal set and track um, based on framework, um, you know, so that you can you can take the goals and the things that you planned in strategic planning last year, and then you can you can kind of track those. We call those OKRs. We'll talk about that. We'll also talk about accountability and framework. Um, so we'll we'll um, get a chance to be able to talk about how you go about um, making sure that you know, the people in the organization that own parts of this, um, that own parts of the actions and the and the things that need to get done, how do they always know that they've got it, right? Because sometimes in mm -hmm. companies, what you get is you get a 
hey, let's do this, right? And then at the end of the week, you all go, yeah, we were going to do that. But a royal we generally means you don't get anything done. So somewhere in the we is we are accountable, but I I have an action to do, right? And so um, this, this DACI accountability framework will show you how do you do that? And then how do you kind of make sure that everyone's owning the pieces that they need so you keep moving forward? Um, and then the last thing we'll do today is talk about, you know, the role of growth in uh, the role of a growth mindset in success. Um, this is, that's about as intelligent as I'm going to sound. This is all Jess. Um, so that wonderful lady has this huge brain and she's got some great, um, you know, thoughts on growth mindset. So when we get there, she'll let loose and you guys will kind of um, feel her kind of lose her mind a little bit. Thanks, Bill. Question just. Are we, I, am I sharing the big screen? Like you see just a full slide or are we seeing this like weird thing with notes? Nope. Yeah. We see the, we see the full slide. At least I, okay. do. I yeah. have two screens. So I just wanted to make sure <laughs> I'm screening oh, the, probably getting the, right the presenters. One. Yeah. Uh, you would not hire uh, me for PowerPoint. No. Okay. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> Uh, you know what, Jess, Jess and I are laughing as well, because last night, um, Jess and I were talking about this. And I said to Jess, I said, the one thing you can't do is give Kenny the PowerPoint slides because Kenny no. can't present. So no. we had under no circumstances, will Kenny get it? And then, yeah. so they said, okay, so you should do it. And I did it. And then it was like, oh my God, like what is happening? So then Jess is like, I'm um, seeing weird things. So <laughs> at very worst, what happens is, Kenny will wind up with a presentation. So yeah, um, luck. Okay. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about like, how can we make our annual plan come to life? Um, I'll give you a short background on, on about me. So I've been working in the natural health uh, product market since 2004. So I work with a live magazine and I've also worked with several early stage companies in the U S and Canada from people just starting out, you know, 1 million all the way through to $100 million in revenue. Um, I've been a support person on helping uh, companies to raise like seed and series A financing and uh, currently do growth advisory. And one of the things that I've noticed over my years and working as a frontline salesperson, marketing director, et cetera, and an executive is that we often write these plans and then they sit, you know, metaphorically get lots of dust and we look at them, you know, at the end of the year and go, oh, how did we do? Um, and it's hard to, to actually make them come to life. So there's a framework here and it's called OKRs. And I'm not sure if anybody's heard of it before. Has anybody heard of this before? Maybe. Okay, looks like Ramona has from what I can see on the screen here. This is a simple way to kind of help us arrange our thinking. So you would have set up your plan already maybe what are my revenue goals? What are some of the key things I want to do? And one way to keep a lens on it is to organize it in this way. So the first thing would be, okay, so what are two or three strategic themes or objectives that I really want to focus on this year? I can't do 10 of them. I can maybe do two or three with the most important values to my business and to make my vision happen. So for some people that could be prepping for scale, I need to hire X amount of people. Maybe I need to raise some money. Uh, maybe I would. I need to make sure I have uh, a good manufacturing partner. Whatever prepping for scale could be one, or I just want to expand my distribution. But that's a big thing for me this year. So that would be the theme. And then the second thing is okay. So how would you know when you hit whatever that theme is? You would set a key result. So these are called KR <laughs> in the OKR model. And they are an indicator of when we've achieved what we want to achieve. And so it helps us start to develop plans, which is the third piece of this model, uh, to define what's the work that I need to do to make this thing happen. A lot of the times in my, my career, I've seen people put together a big number and then they go, okay, go do it. And it's like, well, but like, I actually needed more money to make this happen. We need to hire three more people or whatever it is. And the reason we had a challenge in the execution was because we never took the time to define the necessary resources and work involved to a certain degree in making the thing happen. And this is where we can get our employees involved in doing that. So we're going to show a couple of examples right now of like what we need to bring this model to life. And uh, Sumner, 
everyone's going to get a copy of these slides so they can refer back to this, I think, right? Yes, they are. Okay, cool. Okay. So, Kenny, do you want to kind of talk about this part? Yeah. So we, what we did is we gave two sort of examples today. One, um, one strategic objective would be to expand distribution. <clears throat> and I think the next one Phil's going to do is talking more about, you know, I was either scaling or, or uh, funding, mm -hmm. right? But it's one of these things that it's easy to say and sometimes not so easy to do because I think for the most part is what we're trying to really instill today is that you can talk about these things all you want. But until you put pen to paper, old school, um, or, you know, fingers to computer, I don't care what you do. It's really difficult to hit goals and hit things if you don't put down what you're actually thinking. So an easy one here, we want to increase distribution by uh, 10 stores a month for the next 12 months. If you're at the size where it's 100 stores, it really doesn't matter what the number is. It's just actually putting this down. So we would have done this last December in the last call Phil and I had with you guys. We talk about what do we want to do next year? Here's the thing. So one of the goals, 10 stores, next 12 months, things you need to do. What do we need to do to make this actually happen? And this is the stuff that I really want you to get in the habit of writing down. And the reason I say that I've got three or four clients right now that we're dealing with and ideas are all great and the thoughts for next year were all cool. And now everybody's scrambling to figure out, well, who's doing what or what would happen or what were the things needed to do to get this goal to achieve. So for this particular one is, you know, a couple of things we need to look at. Do we have the costs um, of our of our products that will actually allow this to work so that we can actually do this? Um, and does it also fall within the budget of what we have to do this? Right. So it's it's all the things that we've talked about ad nauseum making sure that whatever we have built into our product can actually fund 10 stores a month for the next 12 months. And does is there enough room in there? Or even if there's a separate bucket, do we have enough working capital, like the last point there, to actually achieve these goals? It's great that we get 10 stores a month. Can we afford to get 10 stores a month? Do I have enough money to uh, make the inventory, to hold the inventory, to make new packaging, to hold new packaging? Um, on this particular one, do we have resources, human resources? Do we have reps? If we do, can we afford reps? If we can't afford the cost of a rep on a monthly salary, do we have a broker system? Um, if we don't want to do either, and we're going to do a lot of the selling on our own, how are we going to distribute? Are we doing it ourselves? Do we have a distributor? If we have a distributor, can we leverage their people differently? Right. Those just basics before we even get to the retail. Next thing is on the retail is, are we ready to actually talk to retailers? Do we have um, communication materials? Do we have sell sheets? Do we have any of the materials or collateral that we would go into a retailer with to actually talk to them about what we're trying to do? And then to deliver them, the launch pad, the marketing strategy is based off of that again. Once we've got in, once we've talked to them, do we have funds? Do we have enough resources to sort of push us through the next part, right? Most of the thing the, with this one, and I'm sure Phil will be the same. And as we go down the list, it's really pen to paper, pen to paper, pen to paper. Don't just think and just don't talk about it. It's actually writing down and putting the steps for this goal. I want 10 stores in the next 12 months. How do I do it? Can I afford it? Where do I find the money? That type of that type of discussion needs to happen. Um, Kenny, if I can add, I Please. think the other thing is when you, um, well, what's really common that we see a lot in companies, uh, particularly is smaller in size, actually in all companies, but uh, particularly when you're smaller in sizes, when, um, when you've got, like, let's say you're, you're working on expanding distribution and then you kind of got everyone thinking the same thing, but everyone's also wondering who's going to kick this thing off. Like what, what is my cue, for example, is a really common thing where people go, well, I'm ready. Let's go. And everyone says, yeah, let's go, let's go. And then, but when you don't have pen and paper, it's also like you, you miss trigger moments. You miss, you know, who's the one who kicks well, who's this going? and goes, listen, like I've got money. So I set aside money, go hire the people that you need to hire. Right. right. Who is that? Right. You know, um, the people who are buying your supplies or your 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 sourcing material. Right. They're going, 
do I buy it now? Do I buy it later? When do I buy it? Like, when do you want me to start making more packages that we're going to sell? So all of this is also part of the same thing is like, you've got to have these moments to, when you're working by yourself, it's easy. You just decide and you go, right? And then it's easy to get things done. But when you are working in teams, we, we need, teams need cues. We need cues to go, we're going. So when is that, right? So part of this, all of this OKR stuff is about when, you know, I wrote a job description, but I don't know if I'm supposed to put it on LinkedIn yet. I don't know if I'm supposed to do something with it yet. Who gives me the green light so I should go? Or you get moments where somebody goes, got it. I got the plan. Let's go. Right. And then you're like, whoa, 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 wait, we're not like, why did you hire four people? We're not ready yet. Right. So there are all these things that you kind of need to OKRs help you structure some of those conversations. So you actually know when to go, when not to go and how to go. Agreed. This is okay. another fun one. So here's point. another really fun one. This is about prepping for scale, right? And so, um, you know, on the flip side of what Kenny's talking about is, you know, it's really, well, I feel like 2024 is going to be about money and everyone's going to be talking about money. But um, when you are prepping for scale, if you're getting more distribution, if you want to go after, you know, more retail outlets, you know, all the things that Kenny asked for on the last page they cost some money, right? Um, whether it be in supplies, whether it be in raw goods, whether it be in hiring more people for the team. And so you are in the same boat here as you made a strategic plan at the end of last year to say, hey, we're going to grow. We're going to do 10 more stores every, every month. Now you've got to work backwards to go, how much more stuff do I want to make? What is that going to cost me, right? And there's um, without getting too financial about it, is there, there's a cost to making the product early, there's a cost to buying the product early, and then there's a cost of, you know, holding on to the product until you can sell it all, right? Because now you've got carrying costs and things like that. And so you got to go back and just do the work to make sure, one, you're asking yourself, how much do I need to grow? So 10 stores, um, you know, we're all kind of like retail people and we're all get up and go people. So you, you'll zero in naturally on, Here's how much money I could make if I got to 10 stores, but what will it cost me to get to the 10 stores? So you got to make sure that you got the money up front. We all know the retailers take a long time to pay, particularly if you're kind of with the big guys, but even, you know, local retailers take some time to pay, right? And so you've got to make sure that you've got some funds to cover yourself when you go. You've got to get um, a plan together so that you know when those funds are being used, right? Because when you, when you find people... Um, when you find your source of income, whether that be um, a bank uh, to get into to borrow some debt, or if you're going to um, bring in a, a co-founder or something like that to get some equity, a shareholder, um, or if you go to friends and family for friends and family discount, um, all of them will want to know how you're how you're going to make use of said funds, right? Because very few of those, you know, kind of um, sources of funds are going to go, yeah, here's the money, just call me when you got my return ready for me. It almost never, actually never happens, right? If that happens, you should actually wonder why they're totally okay with just giving you money. Um, and then you need to call us so we we know we can go borrow some money from them too. But, um, you know, so, so what you want to be able to do is make sure that you are in the same way, getting things ready so that you know, right? So that way, that will be a, a really great kickoff for um, for the rest of the team, right? Is for you to go, listen, I worked out how much money I need. Here's what I need to cover the 10 stores I have and all those sort of things. Um, so what I, you know, so as soon as I've secured the funds, let's go. And so that first moment in this process might be you going, I have cash flush with dollars. Let's go, right? Like there's a clock ticking and I got to get things done. We got to hire the people. Let's go, right? So um, so you you really want to think about those things and make, make sure that you're prepping ahead of time. Some of that is things like an investor pitch deck, um, financial models, audited statements. Um, there are a lot of things to be done. I, I have um, a, a couple of friends um, who are, trying to restructure some of their debt. I'm trying to uh, be fairly optimistic here, but they're trying to restructure their debt. And uh, they said, yeah, we, we we called the bank to see 
um, how they would feel. And they, they wound up getting yelled at by the bank because they called to see how they would feel, how the bank would feel. And I said, do, did you just, you really, you called to do that? And they said, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to know what would happen. I went, oh no. Like, did they, did they ask for your financial statements? Do they ask for what you look like, what your EBITDA is, all that kind of stuff. And they're like, yeah, I didn't know they were going to ask for all that. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what, you know, so um, that's kind of on the far end, the extreme end. I think most of you are somewhere in the middle, but you just, um, again, you know, some of this OKR stuff we're talking about is about making sure that you're prepped and that you know what comes first and what comes next so that when you go, when you go to kickstart your growth plans, you're, you're ready, that you're, you've got all the, the puzzles, the puzzle pieces in play. Thanks, Bill. And so this is a kind of the next step of like keeping us all focused on our whole company, let's say, on making this happen, right? So how can I make sure that everybody's aware of this plan and they're engaged in the plan from a purpose perspective and that they become accountable. So it's not just on the shoulders of the CEO, but actually the whole team, whether that's three people, 30 people, or 300 people is owning this plan, right? So some things that I've seen that work uh, quite well, and it's kind of basic, but a lot of times it gets skipped, I've seen also, <laughs> is, uh, is doing an annual kickoff, like presenting the plan that you've developed with these OKRs in a really simple, easy to understand way to your team um, it's a very effective way of getting people to A, understand what is the direction for the business this year, what are the key objectives and goals, so that as they start to do their work, they can be in the mindset to be helping you to hit the goal and also understanding prioritization. So it becomes a really good lens for say, what to say yes to and what to say no to as we all start to understand like this is the main thing that we need to do this year or the priority, right? So that could look like people in a boardroom. If it's a small team, it could be going out somewhere, doing a little offsite. I'm about to fly to Montreal at the end of this month uh, to do a business kickoff with the national sales team with a client that I'm working on to get them really excited about this. And we're bringing in the operations team for part of that and just getting people rallied around um, this, this thing. So it, it creates momentum, it creates energy, it creates clarity. And then it creates a mechanism for people to start to refer back to throughout the year. So one of the things that can be really great is to ask people as they see this, to have an opportunity um, to ask questions and also to uh, reflect on, sorry, someone is calling me from the, sorry, to reflect on the role that they can play in making this happen. So you've heard about this, like, what do you think you can do to support that? And then having a conversation with the manager, let's say you are a larger company, maybe you've got like 20 staff or something. Uh, each team can work with our manager on the department plan or objectives that are going to support this. Or even if it's four people, okay, I'm I'm doing mostly sales and some off stuff. I'm doing some accounting and finance. And the other person is doing maybe some product stuff and quality insurance or whatever. Like, what can we do? in our areas to make sure that we're aligning with OKRs in this plan. Um, if you do have a structure where you are starting to have multiple direct reports and managers, um, I think it could be really fun um, to do quarterly goals that identify the big projects that support the big picture of the OKRs. So all those tasks that we talked about on the other two slides, the, the example, so developing a retail pitch deck, that would be a project then somebody would be accountable to doing at a certain point of time. And maybe it would be defined in that person's quarterly goal. For example, I want this done by Q1. And then when we check in on it, we know that we're, we're tracking the most important stuff. And it can be even more fun. I've also seen this work well at companies to bonus people on their progress towards the big rocks, like the quarterly goals. So people will focus naturally on what's most important. Um, and then the, the final piece here, I already kind of talked about the importance of mapping a department or team goal to the overall business goal. We don't want people going in different directions. We all want to be aligned. We're all kind of rowing the same boat, if you will. Um, is to re review the program. So we've had our kickoff. We've got people engaged. We've had a chance to ask questions, maybe even challenge the thinking, like why this target versus that? What about why this market versus that? 
let people get really engaged and then let's review the progress. So every quarter you can check in as a leadership group with your whole team. How are we tracking against our OKR uh, that have quarterly goals? Um, and really just be able to make sure that we are checking in throughout throughout the year. So we've got some like frequency stuff there. I worked on executive teams where we would check in on this ourselves as the leaders of the company every like two weeks. And then with our whole company, like every quarter and then one on one would be based on if that person is uh, driving a key project. If I might too, Jess, I think it, because I know some of you are probably a lot smaller. So when you hear stuff like this, totally, yeah. what you don't want to do is is get your, you don't need 70 people to do this. Yeah, yeah fair. <laughs> if, if there's three of you, you're just going to be yeah. doing a lot more of it. But the whole point of all of this is that even if there's a couple of you, let's say you don't do your own manufacturing and you have a co-packer, your co-packer is on your team. Your co-packer would need to know what you're thinking when you're thinking about it, they need to be involved in the plan. If you don't have your own sales team and you're using a brokerage team and or your distributors as your sales team, if your distributor has salespeople, same thing. They need to be involved in your world. So like when, when you hear this, if you're a, a, a sole person and you, you are the company, there are other people around you that, that still are involved with you, I'm assuming. All of you are most likely manufacturing something. So you do have a co-packer. You probably have brokers or distributors. So again, they are part of your team. You may be the one accountable for most of it at that point because you're it, but you still have a team. So I just want to make sure that you're not walking to think, well, I don't have 75 people. I can't do this. It's not true. It's back to pen to paper and assigning the roles. You may be the key person on all of them. I appreciate that. But get your others involved, your co-packer, your distributor, your reps, whomever it is, your banker. Try not to talk to, like Phil said, to the bank too honestly, like those people did. Don't let them know that you're that. Not in tune with the, with the reality of grabbing money these days because they do want a lot more information than they ever have. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to add that, Jess, because just so people don't freak yeah, out. Kenny. No, that's true. Because it sounds like big corporate a little bit. And it's the point is more just like having our plan and reviewing our progress regularly with the people just involved looking and making it. it happen. 100%. Exactly. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I, Even I, with yourself. Have, Go ahead, Phil. Sorry, I just have one more thing to add. Because I, yeah. I noticed this too in small and big companies is when you yes. lead a company, I find that the leader at the beginning of the year winds up repeating the vision and the plan multiple times, right? Because everybody wants to hear it. Everybody wants to know it. Everybody wants to hear it. And so I, I think the value, like when you see things like year kickoff, you don't, you should do this in your style. Um, so it doesn't need to be, you know, a, a band. It the, the doesn't need to be <laughs> balloons or fireworks or, yeah. um you know like you just need At to do it like in your that. style but you do yeah. need what what's easier is you're going to do it once as opposed to even if you've got a team of five to have to repeat the plan five times it's a lot you do it yeah. once in a kickoff and totally. all of a sudden everybody gets in on the plan they hear it once the questions one person's asking the other four are definitely going to want answers to as well so there's some kind of like big things that you want to do here people are a lot of people are are visual well or they want to hear things or they need to connect with examples so mm -hmm. by having something that's a bit more structured it gives people the opportunity to actually connect like physically with it and even if it's like one i've had a hundred billion dollar company and we literally put our stuff on one page that was it that was the big thing and then you can print it out you put it on your wall and then that way you, you stay focused on it. You look at it every day and it's not just saying like, oh yeah, what were we doing again? We're, we're supposed to do, I forgot. Oh, okay. But now I need to send my financials to whatever. So it's just not to oversell this here, but it's very powerful tool and actually bringing, bringing things to life. Thank you for listening on what. So now this is another tool that we could use to make this really easy and straightforward. Phil, do you want to kick it off? Is he frozen? Nice, okay. Sorry, I think I think I'm cutting in and out. I my internet's been great all day. Oh, until, of course. Yeah. <laughs> until now. Um, okay. 
So the other thing that we're going to talk our way through is DIC, D-A-C-I. And it's really, you know, it's kind of a way of making sure that um, accountability is a big word, but what you really need is you need a name beside tasks that need to get done. Um, at the beginning of this, I talked about a royal we, um, and royal we's really suck, right? Because um, they're great for proclaiming things, but royal we's rarely ever get anything done, right? Is we are going to do this. And you're like, who is we? Like there are four of us on this call, which we, which I is the one that's going to get it done for us, right? Like, so, um, you know, so DACI is, is really a, a way for you to be able to make sure that people, you know, well, without being um, jerks about it, without being tough about it, it's just an organized way of making sure everybody knows what their responsibilities are and then everybody knows what they've got to do, right? So in the same way that, you know, you, you get funding and then if your responsibility is to get funding, as soon as you've got funding, your your last job is to signal to the group, hey, I, I got the money we needed. Who's next? Who's up, right? Who's up? What happens now? Right. And so, um, you know, so so DICI we're going to go through and that's that's very much what we're going to be talking about. Thanks. So. So basically, this is a simple, a simple model that just helps us uh, to define the key role, like in any project. And the first piece here is you identify like who's the driver of this, for example, the retail pitch deck, like who is gonna drive it and make sure it happens, make sure that we get the content, whatever design stuff we need, whatever margin analysis and marketing plan stuff and get it all in that pitch deck. So that person is responsible for managing the project, essentially making it happen. That could be you as the founder or one of your right hands or somebody that's managing a certain aspect of your business they're responsible for getting the stuff done and reporting on progress, right? And an approver would be the person who has the final say on whatever aspect of this project. So a lot of the times I've also seen um, things where like one person thought they had the authority to make a decision. And then later they're like, oh no, the CEO wanted to see that thing before he launched it. And they're like, oh, really? Uh-oh. And the CEO hated whatever it was, right? So what we want to know in advance is like, <laughs> who is the approval person? Just simple, right? That way we know in advance and we can make sure that that person um, has the input that is necessary. The other piece here is a contributor. So that in, when Kenny was talking earlier about we might have different parts of our team, like I want to hit a certain level of growth in my distribution. I'm going to drive that growth. My contributor could be my broker. I might want to talk to them about like, well, what regions or what areas should we focus on? You know, how are we going to make this happen? What do you need from me to do this? And we want to rely on that person's like expertise and make sure that our project is successful or maybe they're supporting on a certain aspect of that project. So just getting clear on who are the people on the team that can contribute um, and making this work, right? And then the final piece is informed. So sometimes what can happen, especially if we're doing like cross-functionally work, like we're maybe we're launching a new product, for example, and there's a lot of different people involved. Maybe not everybody's involved, for example, in the design of the packaging or the marketing strategy, but they need to know when you're going to start shipping. Maybe the operations person or whoever's doing the shipping like needs to know in advance so that they can get ready, right? I'm just making up a story here. So the people that are informed are informed because whatever you're doing could impact their workflow or it would be important for them to know this information um, to feel congruent. Maybe I launched an important thing and I want to make sure my sales can feel supported that we have this amazing marketing program that's going to go out and help move units for them. So who should be informed? So those are like the four and roles, right? And then how do we do it? It's really not that difficult. It's just figuring out, okay, so like we saw in the OKR example, what are the main things here that need tasks that we need to do in this project, whether big or small? And I would suggest that we don't want to be nuts about this. Like, 
these to be for projects that have a certain amount of of weight to them a certain amount of opportunity or upside or or risk right like we don't have to be like you know turn on the computer and then like we don't want to be too too uh we don't want to drive people crazy with this but we want this and projects that are very important so we figure out the task we assign the driver who are the roles the approver the contributor and then you can look at the actual workflow of like what needs to be done when and are there any things that need to be done first so a dependency like i need to have this thing happen first before i could go on the other thing right maybe i need to get my my uh regulatory approval uh, before I can start selling this thing. So I'm focused on that first before I do some of the other things. And we're going to show you like an example of this. Um, of just like a simple daisy chart. And we decided to pick a marketing campaign as an example um, to show you guys how maybe this would work um, for this example. So Phil, you want to take it away here? So yeah, kind of so, so the first thing I'm going to say is... Um... You know, the, the titles we have in here are things like VP marketing. And then, so if you're a little company, you're going, you're laughing probably because there is no VP marketing. It's a marketing manager and probably the owner or the CEO. So um, from an approver standpoint, I think, I think you sub the title that works the best, right? But I think what we're trying to do here is give you a sense of like, if you're running marketing, even a small company, and you started to build out a campaign with objectives and a budget. So you've got some advertising you want to do. Maybe you want to try some new messaging. Um, new messaging is a really common one that a marketer will go, listen, it's a new year. This is a new me. I want to try some new shiz and let's get going, right? And and so, you know, when you're talking amongst the group, people are like, that sounds awesome. Let's just go do it. Let's go do it. Let's go do it, right? And so then you get you know, this is a really common thing is then the marketer gets empowered. They go, got it. I've done it. Bam. It's out there. And then all of a sudden the owner shows up and goes, what is this? Like, this isn't the wording I thought it would be. This isn't what it looked like. And all of a sudden you're kind of in this place where you've got stuff out there that doesn't work. Right. And so all we're trying to do is make sure that as you move forward, that you are, this is, um, this is a great way to make sure that you are still staying in lockstep with each other, right? And so um, marketing is a really common place where you change messaging. And so for a, a, the marketer to be the driver to say, hey, I've changed the wording based on what we talked about. And then a really common thing to happen is for the approver, whether that be a VP marketing or the owner or um, the VP sales, the sales director, Whoever else would be um, in on messaging might go, this isn't the way I imagined it in my head at all, right? And so these are really important moments because that keeps the team stitched together. It keeps um, it, you know, for the marketing manager, there's some, um, there's some reassurance that I'm not doing this on my own. There's somebody who's going to eyeball this with me and know that, you know, we're lockstep together. And then the other thing is from the approver side is, it becomes something where there's an obligation, right? Because sometimes you get really busy and you go, look, whatever you do, Kenny and I do this a lot is you go, whatever you do is fine with me, right? But we're two people, right? And so, but we still, both of us know, you said that because you're really busy, but I'm coming back, right? <laughs> I'm coming back. I need to recheck to make sure that you're actually okay with this before I put this out there, right? And so, you know, this, um, the driver and the approver is a really important dynamic. Having someone to sign off on it means you're, it's a shared exercise that you start to do together, right? So um, campaign objectives is one of those. Um, concepts and key messaging causes a lot of friction from the marketing side um, at this time of year while we're trying to redo new things. Visuals is another one of those where I'll see something visually that you know the owner for sure um, who is really kind of like emotionally tied to the business will see things different. And so it's really important to, to know when you're able to go and when you need that kind of approval. And then the other parts in there, right? So contributor can be um, particularly like if you're thinking about launching new products, contributors are people who do packaging, um, you know, like they're going to be in on design. You're going to want to make sure that you're, you're, you're tying them in and then um, sales and logistics, right? I put uh, Black Friday out, but I don't bother to tell the sales team that I've discounted my product 
guess who's going to be really upset, right? Like they didn't, you know, they're the role of logistics is to make sure they fulfill things. But if I don't tell them, they're not in the best position to be equipped to, you know, kind of get this done, right? So anyway, um, an example of DICI, um, really great way to make sure your teams stay lockstep with each other. And then you have some really clear processes for who is interacting with whom, what their roles are. Thanks, Bill. And it's like, it's that upfront work of taking the time to do this that actually ends up like saving a ton of time later of like people, you know, not having to run around, mm -hmm. not knowing who's doing what, stuff like that. So there's some costs like of not doing this. Like, I don't know, Kenny, what have you seen with this? I'll tell you what everybody will probably end up seeing. And again, a lot of times we use these acronyms because if you're trying to use an acronym because it makes it easier to compartmentalize. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But to summarize what will happen, because we've been in enough meetings, the meeting will start and people will look at each other thinking, well, I thought you were doing that. Well, I thought you were doing that. Oh, I thought I just assumed that someone else was going to do that. Or someone else was going to approve it. Like nothing, I, I hate to say, but then what happens is nothing gets done, right? Or things will just be assumed to be done, which means nothing's probably gotten done. So I think if you don't have, and again, I know it sounds very formalized and very corporate, but there's reasons why we try to instill this behavior, even on small companies. And Phil and I do this with, with people we do, and so does Jess. Like I've got a couple right now, again, that we're, we're back to this sort of basics, who is going to own this part of the project? Which is really what this is asking. Who's driving this? Who's going to own this thing, right? And then you're looking for the people. Who's going to be the ones that are going to have a signing authority? How are we going to get this done? Who's going to be involved and how to go? And if you don't have this, what will happen is literally it will be that Zoom meeting where everybody's looking at each other, waiting for somebody to do something, Right. So the cost without it is I just think what you'll, you'll find is you're going to miss a lot of things. And it's just be unfortunate because you've made a great plan in December. You're trying to figure out what it is. And really what happened, you just had a really nice meeting, you put stuff on paper and nobody followed up. That's the cost of not having that, Darcy. 100%. Thanks, Kenny. And they're done that. Me too. For and I've also seen stuff like where, um, maybe somebody on your team had like a really, really cool background in another area or they're really passionate about something or they have really good expertise and then they weren't included in that exactly. project. This has happened to me in my career where I was like, oh my God, why did you include me in this? Like I, number one, I could help and whatever, this is going to impact our work. And number two, like I'm the X person and you just didn't even involve me. And it really made me feel mad and it made me feel like, not valued and pissed off exactly Kenny and it's like and later on because they didn't involve me like they missed five things that I could have helped them um not miss because I had certain expertise and then the project itself would get delayed and it's like bro you could have <laughs> we could have eliminated this stuff <laughs> if we like you know had identified yeah, who in our team can help with this thing or yeah, if you have a younger junior staff it's like super you know, super hungry and really wants to be engaged and learn and develop. Sometimes it can be nice just to bring them in as a contributor or consultant because they get to share some input and learn. And that actually keeps them super motivated. And they're like, wow, I love working here. Like they actually asked me for my opinion on this thing. And, and I'm really excited about that. So um, this is a, a, an accountability tool. And it also can be a very important uh, employee engagement tool and make it in allowing people to be heard in a way that's structured. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we can't say enough about this. <laughs> uh, okay. So that's all we have to say about that. For now we can answer any questions about that in a sec. And um, let's just talk. Oh, am I doing it? Uh-oh. Am I sharing? Something went weird. Oh, no, it is working. Okay. It's on growth mindset right now, right, guys? Everyone? Okay. Okay. Phil, do you want to just kind of kick this off a little and we'll... Yeah, I think so. So this part, um, you know, having having Jess here, Jess is, is kind of a, a really big expert on, on growth mindset. 
Um, what we wanted to do was uh, we knew that some of this other stuff was going to be a bit of a killer in terms of, you know, there's a lot of process here. All right, so I'm just going to stop you. Um, it doesn't look like it's on that slide for me. I don't know. Is it showing for other people as well? Oh, there we go. Oh, there we, there go. we go. Sorry about that, guys. No, nope, no worries. Button, Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We um uh, honestly really quick is is um Jess has kind of uh Jess has got this big brain for growth mindset and uh, we wanted to you know have her kind of we wanted to tap some of her excitement and her energy on this. Uh, we think it's the beginning of the year, and then we we knew that we were gonna we knew we were going to drop some of the stuff on you in terms of like DACI and some of these things are a little bit more process heavy. So we thought um, just having um, Jess kind of come in and, and talk a little bit more about adapt and succeed um, and the mindset you need to do that would, would be a nice jump um, to kind of finish this, this webinar. So um, that's about as smart as I'm going to sound on growth mindset. So Jess, Aww. you should take it from here. All right. Thanks, Phil. Um, so I've uh, been studying like mindfulness for about 20 years. Then I went and did a, a grad certificate in uh, mindfulness teaching and training at the University of Fraser Valley. And it's a big kind of buzzword nowadays. And essentially what we're talking about with adopting a growth mindset is being able to, to deal with the, the inherent changes um, in business and in life, right? Like nothing is, is stagnant. No matter how much planning we do, things can change and things sometimes just don't work for whatever reason. And so learning how to like adapt with, with this, with a skill, uh, number one, regulate ourselves, our relationship with trust as founders, entrepreneurs, and as leaders is super important because it helps us to be more healthy, more present through how we manage our, our relationship with the change and our, our team. And it also helps us uh, to be able to respond more effectively and often with greater speed and greater focus because we're not in resistance. So there's a few attributes. This is a little bit text heavy. Uh, we've done it on purpose just as a takeaway so you can read more about it, but I'll just kind of talk through it here. Um, is that the difference between like a growth mindset and what's called a fixed mindset is someone in a growth mindset, they inherently adopt like flexible thinking. So when I had mentioned like the, the need to adapt, the growth mindset person is focused on the end game. Okay, so we wanted to do X. This pathway is blocked right now. A tree just fell on it. You know, there's a, it's just not working. So am I going to sit there and complain about the fact that the path is blocked? Or am I going to find another way, a new path? The growth mindset person is immediately accepted that I'm, I'm doing this metaphorically, it's just easier. I'm immediately accepting that the tree has fallen on the path and I'm not going to resist and get angry about the fact that the tree has fallen on the path. I am going to see this as a challenge. Interesting. I need to find a new path right now. And I'm going to go ahead and start going and getting on that path. So I'm seeing the challenge as an opportunity for me to learn, for me to grow, um, and that mindset makes it a lot easier for us to have the trait of resilience when things get tough. Things are tough. Business is tough. There's always going to be pressure. There's never going to be a time where a new problem or opportunity doesn't come up. That's just the way it is. It's the waiting for the calm seas is like, it's an illusion. So we need to develop a skill and have staff that we hire that have the same kind of mindset. Then it's just easier and more fun to get things done. And so it's that persistence through obstacles that I just talked about that's like seeing it as an opportunity to pivot, even in sales, right? What's one of the one things we have to be good at in sales? Objection handling. We don't just stop it. No. Oh, he doesn't want it. Okay, bye. No. We ask, well, tell me more about the no. Like, can I better understand, you know, what is it about the solution that's not working or what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, in your whatever it is, and being able to actually get around the, the obstacle or better understand the blocker sometimes helps us to overcome it. And sales thing, objection handling is exactly that. And that's how we close more sales because we don't see a no as the end, right? The tree that fell on the road is not 
uh, this doesn't mean it's over. It means it's another path we need to find, right? And we're willing to put the effort in point three. People who adapt a growth mindset are willing, they know, you know what? Sometimes I have to work a bit harder. So I'm seeing a lot of this with millennials and Gen Z. I manage them. And a lot of them kind of have this like nine to five thing, which is, you know, work-life balance is fine. <laughs> but I come from the school where you, you get shit done. Like it's not nine to five. It's like you do what you have to do to get the thing done. So we want to hire people that are willing to be flexible enough not to overwork themselves, but who actually are engaged in the work to make our goals happen. They're willing to be flexible. Maybe sometimes we have to sprint a bit and we got to be harder for whatever this thing is. And other times we can go back, right? We can go to the doctor on a Friday at one and we don't care if the person takes the rest of the day off. Why? Because they put the effort in generally uh, to achieve our stuff. So this is just like characteristics of, of the growth mindset. The other two things that are really, really important that we want to look for also when we're starting to recruit people is um, how do you respond to like opportunities for improvement, right? So like in sport, we have a coach for a reason. We want to learn how to shoot, I'm not in basketball, but it just came to mind. We want to shoot our basket, shoot better, right? We need a coach to give us feedback on our techniques so we can improve, right? I was a national level competitive gymnast in my younger days, and I was constantly being given feedback on how I could do a better technique. I didn't see that as a personal attack. I saw that as what I need to become the best gymnast I can be. It's the same thing in business. If you're getting constructive feedback from your investor, from your co-founder, or your team, or giving it to a staff, we want them to see that as an opportunity for improvement because nobody's perfect. We all have blind spots. And this is the characteristic of someone who's into growth will take that and they're hungry for it. I see the staff that are the A players are the ones that proactively come to me and say, Jeff, I know you said I'm doing a really great job, but like, what else can I do better? Where else can I grow? Like they're constantly looking for that and they want you to give them feedback. So that's exciting because that's how we grow, learn and adapt and get better, right? And they are happy about the success of others. So they want to learn from their peers. They want, even if they see, if you see a business, your competitor that's doing better than you, for example, instead of getting mad about it or like, oh man, they beat me or whatever, right? You actually look at them and you go, hmm, what can I learn from what they're doing? I'm interested in learning more. Maybe you even reach out to people in your network to, to understand like, how did you get from X to Y? So it's just this, this notion of flexibility and of, uh, interest and passion for growth. I know we have six minutes left. I'm going to give you, I will keep this part to think. Um, three things I can do to bring in growth mindset into my annual planning implementation. Number one, as we go through looking at our progress, let's not be afraid to debrief the success or the failure. We want to understand the drivers of success, but if something like failed, it just didn't work. It's okay to break that because things won't work sometimes. That's reality. Maybe your marketing campaign totally failed and you didn't hit your goal. So what do we think we could do better next time? And by opening up this in a transparent, non-judgmental way, this is kind of where the mindfulness piece comes. It's like acceptance of what is here today. We're not putting judgment on it. People will share their honest opinion with you and you will all get better information and you will all move forward faster. Whereas if we don't have this culture of like, it's okay to see a failure as a learning opportunity, what can happen is you have blame games, you have people that are scared, they're in a state of fear, and they're not willing to acknowledge where they could have improved, they're protecting themselves, it gets very toxic very quickly, and you're simply not listening, you're not learning, and you're probably going to repeat the same mistake. So not wanting to sound too preachy here, but I'm just noticing that by fostering this culture, it can really help us. And to learn quickly and not be scared of making a mistake. It's going to happen. That's okay. Okay. The second part is it's okay also to ditch stuff that doesn't make sense. I have been in so many times where I've been it's part of a leadership group and somebody, the CEO said, oh, we really need to get this thing done. But five months into it, it doesn't make sense anymore. No one cares about the product. Maybe it's not selling. Maybe we didn't do our planning properly. We didn't have enough resource, but we've got another really good opportunity over here that's actually going to help us hit the goal. 
just say, forget it. it doesn't make sense anymore. We're going to do it later or we're not going to do it. We're not going to feel bad about it. I see people literally feel like, because I wrote it on a plan, I want to do it. Well, if it doesn't make sense, don't do it. And don't feel bad about it. And don't make your team feel bad about it. <laughs> I don't know. It's just this thing that uh, being detached sometimes is a very powerful way uh, to help ourselves make decisions quickly without um, spending time and being attached to how we think things should be or should it be, right? And then the final piece, I love this. This is so much fun uh, in our CPG space. I think there's a lot to learn from the technology sector. And they kind of have in technology development, they have this sort of take risk and fail quickly mentality. It's like, hey, just try it and see what happens. So being willing to experiment with stuff. We, will, we may not know the perfect playbook or the perfect way to do something, but we can try. We can try and then we'll learn from there. So, you know, the reality is, is that there is no perfect playbook. I've been in business for 20 years and I've made stuff up all along and it's gotten results. Why? Because the divine plan based on stuff that I see in front of me, that's going to make sense. So it's like understanding the relationships between things is more important than looking for a silver bullet or whatever people say, the perfect thing to help you be successful. Uh, it's more about just being willing uh, to figure things out and to take risks and take steps and to try things. So those are some ways we can do it. Um, and there are practices that you can do to support flexibility and thinking, um, which we could do another time. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening. Hope that was helpful. Can we stop sharing so we can all see each other for the Q and A? Scott, if there is time. Perfect. Thanks for joining us today. We know it's the beginning of the year and everyone's kind of running like crazy. I feel like that. I've been complaining about it all week is I think I came off vacation and everybody else was sprinting and I'm, I'm still kind of walking. Uh, so. And it's sometimes a hard topic too, because it's, it, you know, we're all running and everybody's trying to like Phil said, trying to get stuff done. But I think we do need to take a breath of air sometimes and you have to stop and, and take a look at the plans mm -hmm. And look at the planning and start thinking about how to, you know, continue moving on. Looks like Travis has his hand, hand up there. Yeah, cool. Thanks, guys. I, I was just curious, what, um, if you have a specific example, even, of what, when does it become when you're trying to do too much? Um, mm -hmm. Is that is it uh, so many tasks per per position per person? Uh, is it a is it a value number? Um, just curious if if you had any advice with regards to when you when you realize maybe you're taking on a little too much, you need to focus on this. I think um, to me, uh, I don't know if it's a specific number, um, but to me, it's it's more like you know because so you guys know Kenny and I in particular is we, we, we like to chase things. We like to, you know, kind of do new things and we, we're all over the place. We do the podcast, we do webinars, we do marketing stuff, we do sales stuff. And I think the moment that the two of us trigger when it's too much is the things that we've decided are key priorities. When I'm not accomplishing exactly what I want to do in a key priority is when I go, what are, what is stopping me from doing that? Um, so uh, a specific example is like the two of us, we run a, a tea business called Old Growth Beverages. It's supposed to be a side hustle, but nobody ever, nobody ever tells you that a side hustle takes as much work as a real hustle. Um, but, um, you know, a key, key priority is just being able to um, launch a new product. And, and we have a new product that people freaking love and the two of us, I think in the last two weeks, we've gone, what are we doing? Like, we, we, we can't get this out. Like if, you know, this, the, you know, from a priority list, this immediately impacts sales. And the two of us are busy enough that we haven't been able to get ourselves organized to get this thing launched. Do you know what Like, so, so Travis, to mm -hmm. me, that is a key indicator that says, what are you doing that is getting in your way? Sales is one of the number one priorities for a little brand or for most brands. So if that's, if 
I'm doing so many things that I can't get to that, then I need to relook at the things I'm doing because I'm clearly doing too many. That's right? fair. Or, you know, or I'm chasing something wrong. Yeah. Or you might need to step up. That would be another one. It depends. <clears throat> but one, if you're yeah. looking for just like a simple number in the sense of just a, a place to start, usually what they say is like for the annual plan or even the quarter, like no more than three big rocks or five, three to five is enough. If you've got like 10 things, and all of them are like big, big rock, you know, milestone. It's probably too many. So you want to just cut it down to like three to five is a good place. And then to um, Bill's point, like if you're finding that the big rock you can't get to, you're either doing too much or you might need to hire somebody. You might be at a point where, oh, I could really use like a coordinator, for example, that kind of thing. Thanks, Sharon. But Travis, probably in your business is the same as like Phil and I think, but first off, shiny object is a fundamental problem sometimes with Phil and I, right? And what'll happen, typically what the trigger is, we'll be sitting talking to each other and we start actually writing things down and it's amazing how many things we've missed, right? And it's typically, this is why we we do try, It's it, we do a lot of do as we say, not as we do, because we, and we, but we do have lately been trying to do the same things, put it on paper, put it down. What have we done? What have we missed? What can we take off this list that might have been important two months ago, but really isn't anymore? It's all of it. It's, it's it's very fluid. But you'll know, like if you're talking to your siblings, you'll know, like you guys will look at each other and nobody will nobody will know what actually was supposed to get done or who was supposed to do it. Usually the first sign that you probably got a little too much going on. Right. Oh, and then Aaron has a question. I gave you my email just in case we run out of time. Can we put um, Bill and Kenny's email in the chat too in case people have questions? Uh, someone type for me. Sorry. <laughs> um, Aaron, second question. How do you measure the success of the goal setting framework and what indicators or milestones indicate the company is on the right track, right? Um, the short answer to that is basically for that piece, um, is are you achieving your goal? So when we had the key results model, that needs to be measurable. I want to hit, you know, 2 million in revenue this year, X amount, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And what those results are the metrics that you use to evaluate your success. So if the business is constantly underperforming every year at like 60 or 70% of plan, you either have a problem with execution or you're setting goals that are too big, or you don't have the right resource. So it's really simple. It's like, how are you succeeding? You should be looking for ideally at least 80% and ideally 100, right? So that's kind of like a main thing uh, there. And then the the growth mindset piece, I, I'm happy to talk with you offline because it might take a little bit longer to, to answer it um, right now. If you want. <laughs> Wonderful. So it does look like we are um, just a little bit past the, the hour here. If anyone does have any other questions, uh, Phil, Kenny, and Jessica did provide their email address in the, the chat. Um, I'm also happy to send out the contact information once I send out the sure. post event email as well with the slides and the recording as well. And included in there will be a quick survey. Um, if you could please fill that out, that's greatly appreciated as it lets us know how we did today and you know what we could improve on so that's very valuable for us and just want to say phil kenny and jessica thank you so much for taking the time to speak with our members today and such valuable information really appreciate the time and yeah I'll leave it to the three of you if you have any other words thanks for everybody for joining yeah. us i hope you got something thanks out of that yeah. thanks everybody yeah appreciate it and hope you guys got something valuable and reach out any time if you have questions to any of us uh, about any of the stuff there. We're, We're not hard help. to find. You guys all know that. If you need something, just ask. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay warm. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.